Good day to you, friends. I am very deeply honored and very much humbled to have this opportunity to address you. By way of polite introduction, my name is Henry, Patrick Henry Jr., at your service. I had the very high and unmerited honor to have served five terms as the first elected governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia after we separated from Great Britain. We are currently, throughout the whole of the country, with great solemnity, reflecting upon the great sacrifice made by our Savior and his subsequent uh, resurrection, and I have been desired by a close friend to speak as to my personal views uh, with regard to religion and the nature of state, especially as we are now at a time of national crisis. Amongst the many other strange things which have been said of me, I hear that it is said by the deists that I am one of their number, and that indeed many good people think that I am no Christian. The thought of this gives me greater pain than would the appellation of Tory, for I consider religion to be of infinitely higher importance than politics, and I find I have much cause to reproach myself for having lived so long and not given more public and determined proofs of my being a Christian, for that is a character which I prize above all others this world has or could boast of. After all, I was named after my uncle, the Reverend Patrick Henry, who continued to serve as the parish rector at St. Paul's Parish of the Episcopal Church until his passing in uh, 1784. Unlike many of my contemporaries, I did not receive my classical education at the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, uh, but rather was schooled at home to the classical style by my father and my uncle, both devout religious men, the Holy Bible my chiefest textbook. I continued to read it one hour daily, at least one hour daily, and Bear this in mind, too, and imagine what civil discord this must have created in the Henry household at the time, but many years ago, when I was still a wee lad, my mother and all of my sisters announced at the dinner table one afternoon, with my reverend uncle there present, that they had embraced the Presbyterian faith. And so naturally, as a young lad, I was taken, too, to hear the sermons of those great dissenters in the hills of Hanover in the 1740s and 50s. Needless to say, Religion is a very profound influence in my life. For those of you who may have heard me speak during the time of our American Revolution, you may have observed that my rhetoric was filled with scriptural allusions, that time and again I compared the people of America at that time of crisis to the children of Israel, whom, to remind you, were somewhat contented to live as the slaves to the Pharaoh in Egypt so long as he was a loving parent and a kindly master. But when his heart was hardened, and he degenerated into a hard and cruel taskmaster. Almighty God himself divided forth the Red Sea and led his chosen people to the promised land. I fervently believed then, as I do now today, that we are engaged in such an expedition to a promised land. I was recently reminded in a letter from my old friend, President George Washington, that there is a time of considerable crisis at hand throughout the whole of these former American colonies, now states. He reminded me, for example, that there was a terrible plague which afflicted many of our cities, indeed ravished them. The entire population of uh, Philadelphia City, for example, was decimated by the yellow fever, and it spread. It's cause unknown to us, cure unknown. He reminded me of the fact that our trade has been suffering greatly abroad from piracy, he reminded me that we have had two rebellions in our country, both the Whiskey Rebellion and Shays Rebellion. He reminded me of these democratical societies, Frenchmen which have been springing up all over the country doing everything they can to undermine the efforts of the current administration in favor of the French government. Because of these democratical societies, President Adams has just recently enacted the Alien and Sedition Laws, which are contrary to everything we fought against Great Britain about throwing men in jail for expressing their opinions in their own newspapers, for example, unconscionable. Because of the alien and sedition laws, we now have Messrs. Jefferson and Madison penning the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions, in effect saying that we have the power, we have the authority to nullify any law that the Congress enacts if we find it unfavorable. That's nowhere in the Constitution, as I pointed out 10 years ago. Recently, New York and Massachusetts have both threatened secession. In short, my friends, President Washington and I are both very uh, fearful that we are on the verge of disunion. 
And the purpose of his letter to me was to ask me to stand for nomination to the Virginia Assembly, as I have refused so many federal appointments already, thinking that with the reverence that many of the people of Virginia still have for me as their first governor, that perhaps I can persuade Virginia to stay in the Union. And, as he puts it, as Virginia goes, so goes the Union. Where does religion fit into this? Well, it is the path that we must certainly take if we are going to preserve this Union upon which our existence hangs. As I wrote many years ago, Christianity softens the human heart. It cherishes and improves its finer feelings. It restrains men from their vices. It promotes good order and adherence to civil law. Is this not something we should encourage? Well, prattled on long enough, I suppose, about my own particular views. It occurs to me that there might be a question or two or three, or a comment for that matter, uh, from some of you who might be privy to this conversation. I'd be pleased to hear them now. Yes, uh, we have questions coming in, and anybody who is uh, joining us, please, if you have a question, just put it in the comments. Uh, but before we get to some of those, there was something you said just a moment ago that I want to revisit. I know that uh, President Washington has uh, uh, approached you. Many have wondered why uh, you, not, you have refused so many federal appointments. It seems as though, uh, fearful of it, you could do more if you were part of the system. <laughs> uh, President Washington, during the time of his eight years in that office, offered me Secretary of State, uh, Minister of War, envoy to Spain, and Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. I uh, humbly and uh, politely refu refused them all. And most recently, President Adams has uh, suggested that I serve as Secretary of State, envoy to Spain, Minister to France, and there was also considerable discussion of my standing for nomination for the second presidency for the election of 17 and 96, coming from Alexander Hamilton himself. I uh, refused and uh, humbly uh, declined all of these offers. Why, you wonder? For one thing, a point of honor. It would be most unseemly for me to hold high public office in this federal system after I'd so vigorously opposed it in the first place. You may remember, friends, that I was the most vigorous opponent of the federal system of government, at least Virginia's ratification of that particular plan. I also wanted to get out of politics because there's no money in politics. I wanted to return to the profession of law and to planting and provide for all of my many children. Ill health has plagued me ever since the time of the revolution, brought on by the strains of that particular fight at the time. Refusal to become a puppet or a pawn of one of the immediately emerging political parties that formed after the formation of the federal system of government. And finally, if you could avoid going to Philadelphia, wouldn't you? I don't know, I've heard good things about Philadelphia. Oh, make no mistake, it's a marvelous metropolis. Uh, the people were very friendly. We were lavished with en entertainment for the two times that I was there attending the Congress. Uh, no, my, uh, my issue with Philadelphia City, sir, <clears throat> is the size of it. I'm from the backwoods. I'm happiest when my nearest neighbor is 25 miles distant from me, which is the case now in Charlotte County, where I make my home at Red Hill. No, Philadelphia is not for this country boy. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, earlier uh, you said honor was also a reason. I think that uh, Colonel Mason, may God rest his soul, would really respect that in you. Now, we have m many questions coming in, so I'm going to get to those. And I'm going to start with one. This, this is a bit of a, a more dour subject, but uh, I figured best to address it immediately. Mary was asking about the uh, mental condition of your first wife and, and what treatments did she receive? and maybe even just that situation for those who are unfamiliar. It was uh, some years ago, <clears throat> and a, a very sad and tragic uh, matter for the entirety of the family. In about 17 and 71, my first wife, Sally, as I called her, Sarah Shelton by name, uh, became withdrawn from the rest of the family. This was shortly coincidentally after the birth of our youngest son, Nettie, who had just uh, turned five. And shortly after my, uh, no, he, he was to see her die at the age of five. Shortly after his birth, she became withdrawn from the family, uh, 
at times appeared to be unable to even recognize her own children, she bore me six, became completely mute, would not or could not feed herself, times when only I could do so, and uh, towards the end was given to self-injury to the point where I had to have made for her a, a straight dress so that she could not inflict that punishment upon her very delicate frame. It was at that time suggested that I take her to Williamsburg and place her within the care of the public hospital there on Francis Street, which is the first of its kind in North America to care exclusively for lunatics, idiots, and those of disordered minds. And I did visit there. I spoke briefly with the Hebrew physician who cares for those tormented souls, but determined very quickly on I could not suffer my beloved Sally to that same barbarous fate. But with electric shocks and complete seclusion for, for days. And so we, uh, we had made for her a most commodious chamber at the half cellar at Scotchtown, my plantation at the time. Um, she was very lovingly and, and uh, tending, tenderly uh, taken care of by two negresses in my own regular frequent absences. Remember, this was the early 70s when the re revolution was just beginning. And I had a very large part of that away from home in Williamsburg. And um, well, finally, after about four years of this terrible anguish, especially upon my children, uh, she uh, passed on from this mortal plane in February of 17 and 75. And I have, of course, observed an appropriate period of mourning, uh, more than two years, but I have since remarried to Dorothea Spotswood Dandridge Henry, who has uh, thus far blessed me with 11 more children to add to my six previous. Well, thank you, and that actually leads us uh, wonderfully to two very similar questions from Mary and from Abby. They want to know about uh, if you can share a little bit about your wife and children, and since you talked about your first wife, I thought it might be a time to talk about your second wife and, and children, and if there are any grandchildren. Uh, Dorothea, or Dolly, as I call her, is uh, considerably my junior. When we married, uh, I was 42 years of age, and she only 21, thus half my age. And frankly, I've known her since she was a very young child, because she is the daughter of Nat Dandridge, who was one of my neighbors. He just a couple or three years older than I. And we were boyhood friends, uh, hunting and fishing together, learning the language of the birds out in the, the out of doors. So imagine the, uh, the great satisfaction I derived when I did marry Dorothea in Williamsburg in 17 and 77 that I was now able to call my old boyhood chum father-in-law. Uh, she has, uh, again, as I say, blessed me with 11 children. Uh, my sons are uh, currently, uh, if not reading law with me, they are attending a college, which is not too far distant from our home at Red Hill, Hamden, Sydney, of which I happen to be a trustee. And um, my daughters are all lovely ladies and uh, following the, the Henry spirit uh, in terms of their wildness and their love for the out of doors and nature in general. Wonderful, thank you very much. Um, here I have a question from Craig. He asked two questions, but both of them uh, circle around the idea of uh, fighting for liberty, uh, demanding freedom, and, and liberty and yet continuing to hold slaves. Is that not hypocritical? Is, is there something that the Constitution should not have done to, to recognize this? I'm certain this is a question that you have wrestled with previously. No, well, it most certainly is, uh, Craig. Uh, back in 17 and 73, there was a movement towards abolition of the institution, organized chiefly by the Society of Friends, the Quaker, uh, men. And one Virginia-born Quaker by name of Pleasance had sent to me a number of pamphlets uh, decrying the, uh, the institution. I had already come to the realization from my Christian beliefs that it was moral, uh, immoral and repugnant to the first impression of right and wrong. That while we were struggling for freedom ourselves, yet we had uh, held people in bondage. I still do. I still now currently have 89 slaves. And uh, whereas I am now legally able to free them, 
Um, still, I, I require their services, and they require me. We're dependent upon one another. It's a nasty and ugly business, uh, but at least we are start, starting to take those first few strides into seeing the gradual withering away and death of that abominable institution. Is it hypocritical? Yes, I must tell you that on a, on a moral level, it certainly is. Thank you very much, Mr. Henry. I have two questions here that uh, uh, I think might actually pair together. Uh, two Dugs. Um, one Doug uh, earlier asked about Dr. De Sequera. Another Doug has asked about, uh, pointed out that you were an admirer of the Quakers, and would you speak on your efforts to bring more religious diversity to Virginia? Uh, Dr. De Sequera, you had mentioned earlier at the public hospital, uh, is Jewish, a Jewish man, if I'm not mistaken. Quite so. And uh, he was the first Hebrew that I had ever met. And to my certain knowledge, for a period of time, shortly after his arrival, he was the only Hebrew in all of Virginia, which reached, remember, in those days, all the way from the Atlantic Ocean, westward to the Mississippi River, and northward to the south of the Great Lakes, one Hebrew in the whole of the country. Then, happily, uh, for purposes of the diversity of religion in our society, uh, the 16th article of the Virginia Declaration of Rights, which we ratified upon the 12th of June of 1776, declared that all men are equally entitled to the free exercise of religion according to the dictates of conscience. Since that time, we have seen changes in our laws regarding the privileges as well as the rights of all men all free men. Uh, so now, Hebrews and Catholics and any other uh, dissenting uh, from the, the, the uh, Episcopal Church uh, denomination in Virginia enjoy the rights of land ownership, for example, as much as they want, as before they did not. And uh, since that time, we have seen a, a, a very substantially uh, large Hebrew congregation in Richmond Town, our new capital. So the numbers are growing, and I encourage, of course, these uh, different religions from the old world. We have a vast country that we have to populate, and I don't want to populate it with hapless slaves. I want to attract the old men of the old world, the men who are known to animal husbandry, for example, and finance, to shipping, to industry. That's who I want to attract to our country. Wonderful. Thank you very much. I have one here that I, I think will be easy. I don't know if we'll need a lot, but Christina wants to know why you prefer a black wig over a powdered one. <laughs> well, Christina, it's a matter of uh, not only taste, but of frugality. Uh, my father, Colonel John Henry, was the first on the Henry side of the, of the family to come to these shores uh, from Aberdeen in Scotland. And he came, as many Scots uh, possess, uh, a very frugal spirit, which I inherited certainly from my father. Powdering a wig costs more money than it should, and it's, uh, it's a nasty business besides. Uh, we don't require them in, uh, in the profession of law, for example, here in Virginia, as they do uh, in Great Britain. Uh, I do not aspire to any lofty heights of impressing people with the fact that I'm wearing a powdered wig at any ball that I might attend in Williamsburg or in Richmond Town, for example. I don't go to the balls to begin with. I wear a wig because, whereas it's not so fashionable as it was when I began wearing them some 40 or 50 years ago, uh, nonetheless, I confess to a touch of vanity. Because like my father before me, I began to lose my hair up, tight, uh, up top at a rather early age. So uh, wearing a wig will hide that, uh, that blemish. Thank you very much. Um, much earlier, uh, Phyllis had pointed out that you acted as an executor of the will of John Dashburn, Louisa. This was uh, many years ago, back in 69. Uh, but she wanted to know, in general, a little bit more about your early career as a lawyer. There are some of my contemporaries who make um, a great sport of the fact that I did not follow the customary approach to the learning of law. I did not read law with a, uh, a mentor, an established attorney, for four or five years, which was commonplace. Certainly, I did not attend any law school. There were no law schools in America, and the idea of going to England to attend law school was certainly out of the question. So I borrowed as many law books as I could lay my hands upon, 
and read them in six weeks' time uh, before I made that fateful journey to Williamsburg to stand for my examinations. I was uh, able to uh, receive the two required signatures upon my law certificate, Mr. George Wythe and, uh, and Mr. John Randolph, God rest his soul, both uh, saw uh, some promise in me as an attorney in terms of my legal arguments. But I was no stranger to the court of law prior to my actually receiving my license. I was working at the time for my father-in-law at Hanover Tavern, which is just opposite the road from Hanover Courthouse. Court days in Hanover County is a very large affair. It's not just uh, legal cases being heard in the courtroom, but there are there, there are dances, there is uh, groups gathering together, there are plays that can take place on the courthouse, uh, the courtyard. Uh, there's all sorts of events, and naturally, being so close, I was privy to many of the proceedings in the law court itself. I uh, hope I do not appear boastful with this particular admission, but uh, I have always had a rather uncanny uh, ability to observe human nature and play upon it. And uh, that perhaps is what made me uh, so successful uh, right from the start, contrary to, or to, uh, contrary to not having the great education legally that many of my contemporaries did. Uh, Mr. Jefferson, for example, read law with George Wythe for four years, not so with me, and I believe he resents me for it too. Uh, at any rate, I was very busy in those first three years of my uh, profession, handling no less than 3,000 different legal matters. Uh, commonly, uh, thereafter, and after I was uh, certi certified to profess law in the general court uh, in Williamsburg uh, back in 69, I was also handling a great many more legal matters uh, than most of my contemporaries or my colleagues in the general court. Uh, the knowledge of human nature and from simple observation, uh, assists a, a lawyer uh, no matter what the case might be in terms of his education. As I told Jefferson upon several occasions, as a matter of fact, when he would be complaining about having uh, put so much study into a particular legal matter and then being shot down almost immediately, I, I told him then, don't study law, Jefferson. Study men. That's where his great weakness was. Well, that's wonderful. In fact, Tina seemed to anticipate this. She uh, said in reference to your, your uh, law education that you were mu very much a self-made man. As we move forward here, oh, we still have so many questions. I'll see how many we can get to. Um, here's one um, from Kevin asking how important the Raleigh pub was. I imagine he means the, the Raleigh Tavern. Well, I, I can tell you, sir, that I can regard the Raleigh Tavern as being every bit the birthplace of American liberty than even the Capitol building just down the street. Uh, there were several very important events that took place in the Raleigh Tavern that had very much to do with propelling us to the point of liberty and independence. You see, any time that the House of Burgesses would do something to offend the royal governor, and by extension, His Majesty the King, we could be dissolved, terminated as a legislature, even before we'd completed our necessary business. But there were several occasions when instead of simply returning to our several homes after being dissolved, we would journey down the street to the Raleigh. Why the Raleigh? Well, the largest room in the city is the Apollo Room, with the exception of the ballroom in the governor's mansion. Committees of correspondence got their first start in the Raleigh Tavern. The idea for an association or an embargo of trade with our mother country to try to, to try to bring about some peaceful reconciliation in the Raleigh. The first call for a Congress took place in the Raleigh. And many other events besides of a political nature as well as a social nature. Uh, there were a great many men who would learn the news from other parts uh, of, uh, of uh, America while at the Raleigh, either gaming or dining or, or lodging there. So it's a, a very important uh, place in our society. When the capital moved to Richmond from Williamsburg in uh, 1780, there were 14 taverns, all of which followed the new seat of government, uh, except for two. And those were the American Eagle and the Raleigh, which is there still, I'm given to understand. Thank you very much. 
Um, again, we have so many questions and only time uh, for a few more, but some really good ones here. So maybe we'll get to them a, a little bit quicker. Dale commented that he was surprised to hear that uh, Hamilton uh, was trying to get you to uh, be involved, that you were colleagues with him, as you two seem very opposed politically. Do you care to comment on that? I, I never met uh, Mr. Hamilton face to face, and I was certainly very much opposed to many of his schemes. Still am. The idea of a national bank, for example, is, is uh, disgraceful, especially here amongst Virginia planters such as myself. Uh, but the first real election was in 1796, when uh, after President Washington so magnanimously decided to step down from that office. And not only was it Mr. Hamilton who was suggesting that I stand for nomination to the office of the presidency, but there were a number of New England men even uh, who were writing me not only personal letters, uh, but uh, public letters published in newspapers, uh, begging me to stand for that office. Uh, I, of course, refused them all for the reasons that I mentioned earlier. Thank you very much. Um, here we have uh, a wonderful question from Caleb asking, what inspired you to write your Give Me Liberty or Give Me Death speech? <laughs> That's going back some years. That was 17 and 75, and I did not write it. Uh, I have never written my orations in advance and simply read them from the floor once recognized. There are men who do. Uh, there are other men who will give their prepared statements to someone of better voice to have him uh, read their remarks. Uh, but I always spoke extempore for my mother wit, and uh, such was the case that particular occasion in Richmond town. I'm not uh, claiming that I have the original uh, authorship rights to the idea of liberty or death. That I would give over to a Mr. Addison, a, uh, a British author and playwright from the earlier part of that century. Uh, but nonetheless, the point is well taken. And I stand by those words today. Um, Here's a question from Brian. That he says he doesn't presume that you're a man of regret, but if you were to indulge in the hypothetical, what is the one regret you might have regarding your p political life? Well, Brian, I would, I would have to say that it was accepting the nomination and the appointment as the governor for a fourth term. The year was 1784. I had already served three terms, but the question before us at that time was the question of church and state. I fervently believed, and still do, that we should continue to encourage ministers of the gospel by assuring that they have some moderate means, a, a, a salary, a way of providing for their families, because otherwise they're going to have to find other occupations, and then we won't have any ministers, and then we won't have anyone teaching us as to virtue and reinforcing it. Um, there was another plan that was also quite popular at the time, as my assessment bill. It was Mr. Jefferson's statute for religious freedom. And uh, I believe it was a rather shrewd political maneuver on the part of one Mr. James Madison to nominate me for governor for a fourth term because that would take me off the floor of debate in the House where I would no longer be able to use my considerable uh, oratorical skills to push for my own bill. It was defeated, and uh, we've seen what happened since the, uh, the, the instatement of, of Mr. Jefferson's statute. Thank you very much. Uh, here's one from John, and I imagine this is a pretty simple question. How long was the term for Virginia governor? Uh, the term for governor is rather limited. Uh, even today, in this year of 1798, the Constitution states that the chief executive may stand for no more than three consecutive one-year terms, at which time he must stand down to uh, private station for at least four years to remember from whence he came before he might hold the office of governor again. As I was the first governor appointed in 1776, I was required, therefore, constitutionally, to step down from the office in 17 and 79, did so happily, by the way, and then uh, accepted a fourth and a fifth term in 84 and 85, leaving in 86. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Doug 
states that uh, he understands you had a close relationship with uh, George Mason and that you were one of his closest, he said you were one of his closest friends. Uh, can you just tell us briefly about your relationship with him? Yes, I miss Colonel Mason very, very dearly. In almost all matters political, we were of one mind. Uh, a considerable, uh, talented uh, gentleman, very knowledgeable in all points of, of uh, life and society, especially the law, and yet he was not a lawyer. I'm very happy he wasn't because otherwise I would have had to face him in the general court and wouldn't have been so successful as I eventually was. He knew more law than I did. His chiefest uh, contribution, of course, <clears throat> to me, is he is the chief architect of the most important document ever conceived in mankind's history. I speak of the Virginia Declaration of Rights. Uh, despite uh, loathing public service and leaving his beloved Gunston Hall, uh, nonetheless, when the Fifth Convention was meeting in Williamsburg in, June of seven, in May and June of 76, he came down armed with that rough draft, uh, which eventually has, of course, set the tone for at least eight other states, uh, to my knowledge, and uh, finally getting a, uh, a semblance of his excellent declaration to our federal constitution. Still too feeble and too few for me, in my humble view. But anyway, we lost, uh, we lost Colonel Mason just a few years ago, and he's, he's very greatly missed, not, a, not only as a, uh, a very great statesman, uh, but as a close friend. Wonderful. Well, we have time for just two more, and I think this is a wonderful uh, transition into the second to last question. Jenny wants to know, what would you say to future generations if they faced a federal government that seeks to infringe on their rights? I, in fact, uh, have been considering that very thing. Despite my vigorous opposition of the Constitution in the fir first place, nonetheless, I am a true Republican. Now, that's with a small letter R, not a capital one. I do not mean to associate myself to Mr. Jefferson's faction. But a true Republican will, of course, submit to the will of the majority. Despite my uh, vigorous arguments against the ratification of that document in Richmond of June in, uh, 1788, a, a slight majority of Virginians, my colleagues, favored ratification. Final vote here was 89 to 79 Virginia became in favor. Virginia became the 10th state to ratify. It was the law of the land. And so I resi resolved at that time and told the gentleman that, very well, have, your will is done and I'm uh, pledging to be the most peaceable of all United States citizens thereafter. I had already made uh, very clear that the states do not have the ability, at least in the federal constitution, to secede from the Union. I am also a strict constitutionalist, and I believe in abiding by the law. Now, if a government is clearly suppressing all of my rights and liberties, despite all of my legal constitutional uh, methods at bringing about redress through elections, honest, fair, and regular elections, uh, then I say the only course left to you, and it should be a last resort, is overthrow the government. I intend to make those very points made uh, clear when uh, it's finally the day for elections in Charlotte County early next year. Thank you very much. And for uh, your last question, sir. I understand that you have recently retired from, from uh, being a lawyer, from public life. How? Uh, what are you going to do with your retirement? How do you see uh, your future? Uh, yes, I, uh, I finally uh, gave up the profession of law altogether just two, now three years ago. Uh, but I'm still quite active at home in Charlotte County. I spend most of my time there at Red Hill. I'm a planter, and uh, currently in all of my various properties throughout uh, Virginia and North Carolina, I'm producing 25 hogsheads of, of tobacco a year. This, of course, does not mean that I'm actually in the fields picking that tobacco, but still there is some management uh, that is required that uh, I'll oversee my overseers, if you will. I uh, enjoy my days at Red Hill by playing fiddle and reading 
I read the Bible quite a bit um, whenever ill health uh, does not prevent it. I'm still engaging in land speculation, and I'm, I'm confident that I'm going to be able to leave all of my surviving children with substantial estates. And furthermore, at this time, I have 77 grandchildren, so you can well imagine how busy they keep me. Well, friends, I, uh, I have delighted in this time that we've had together and pray that we will have this opportunity in future. Remember my words about the importance of virtue and morality in this republic, for as history shows, uh, if we are not a virtuous people, that republic will fall just as did Rome. Godspeed. Programs like this are made possible due to the generosity of our donors.